You changed my my background. Oh, but the pyramid is literally shooting out of your head. It's perfect. Yeah, it is pretty perfect. It just a... saturates us with authority. <laughs> All right. Um, here's my work background. <laughs> uh, I just watched uh, what was it some Al Jazeera thing about the book background thing that everybody has to do when they're appearing on anyone's show ever and how they choose books, blah, blah, blah. Hey, Wait, is that a right? thing? People choose which books are behind them? It's or? it's like a thing that now producers even go in and like examine like the bookshelves, like move things around, make sure something's not like too like too asking to be looked at, you know. So I you don't want the like the the rise yeah. and fall of the Third Reich that has like a big swastika yeah, on yeah, it. You like, want like <laughs> a marks, but mostly Thomas Pickety. <laughs> you need like right. an expert for this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Color coding's out because it shows you don't read. You don't. You don't want like all three volumes of Capital, so people actually think that that's you too read much. it no, because no, nobody is like, actually Richard read. Wolf can get away with that, but like, you know. I want every book on my bookshelf to be twelve rules for life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next time you come on, <laughs> I'll arrange you a very special bookshelf. <laughs> It's like one of those nightmare nightmare dream sequences where like you're taking a book off the shelf and you open it up and it's all twelve years from uh, twelve rules for like fuck. Oh man, it's a nightmare. Rip every book down. You're like it's all the same. I worry though that in my dream, like as I'm reading it, as I consign myself to finally read it because it's the only option, it slowly becomes siege and then it just never ends. Never. Well, Siege does kind of never end. It does in a weird way. Yeah. I love that Red Skull thing, by the way. To take on this tremendous task of making sense of the Croatian national project, we decided to phone in a ringer, our friend and comrade, Kemal Majerak. I gotta be straight with you though, listener. Kemal is calling into the show mid-flight on his way to a conference on non-Euclidean jazzometry at the Mariana Noes Trench Jazz University, so the quality ain't the best. Out of solidarity with his situation, Ray also opted to slightly reduce his recording quality, which I believe was a bold choice. Kamal covers a lot of 19th century ground in this episode, so we're running a bit longer than usual. We're returning to Vuk Karadzic back in Serbia for a bit to help explain his Croatian counterpart, Ludovic Gaj, and their rather sus efforts to use linguistics as a way to help invent the Serbian and Croatian nations, respectively. He explains the idea of Illyrianism as a primordialist national idea, and its evolution into the Croatian national project. Kemal brings the Hungarian National Project into the picture as well, and describes the effects that Hungarianization had on the Croatian scene. He talks about the nationalist cred that Dubrovnik and Bosnia offered the development of Croatian identity, and the half-assed attempts to redefine them as authentically Croat. Kemal introduces Ante Starcevic to the pod, a controversial figure, lionized by neo-fascists in Croatia even today, and gives us a sense of the actual man behind the myth, and if that wasn't enough, you also get to hear about Bosnia as a model colony of the, the Habsburgs, the triune kingdom of, you know, two kingdoms, both party of rights and the pure party of rights in the 20th century, so that's two for the price of one there, and their own Josip Frank, who laid the groundwork for the rise of the Ustasha shortly thereafter. So, fuck yeah, it's a long one, but ain't you lucky to have a swell guy like Kamal guide you through it. So we're going to head now to the show with uh, past Fritz asking past Kamal the most pressing of, of all questions. So uh, Kamal, I guess the first question is, um, what kind of Serbs are Croats? Ooh, this is a tricky question. Um, <laughs> so I believe last time you guys talked about uh, Vuk Stefanovic Karadzic, if I'm right. That's uh, right. And a little bit about his ideas of what makes a serve. And Vuk, as a, a prominent and distinguished linguist and folklorist, um, had this idea that all Stokovian speakers um, are Serbs. These are people of a broad uh, dialect. So 
Yes, VUC had a very linguistic idea of how to divide nations within the region. Um, he thought you could use language as scientific data, as a kind of give a scientific basis to classifying all these different peoples out here. He was a, a folklorist and he went with a set of linguistic criteria that said the people who speak this certain dialect called Shtokavian are Serbs, regardless of what they call themselves. People who speak Chakavian are Croats, regardless of what they call themselves. And people who speak Kaikavian are Slovenes, regardless of what they call themselves. What and, would people have called themselves otherwise? Well, here's the interesting thing, is that it turns out, surprisingly, not everyone agreed with him on this. No. Yeah. <laughs> About identity? If you believe it or not, it turns out um, huge swaths of the region and an entire intellectual class uh, vehemently disagreed with him um, it happens but what about like the like the ordinary people themselves like i think what fritz asked was more about that like how would they self uh, describe uh, a lot of them like like i i, I maybe i'm like i think i heard that uh, in most of the time in the like early 19th century or before that people would in these areas describe their language as like Uh, Slavic, like Slovinsky or something like they, they wouldn't necessarily call it Serbian or Croatian. Right. So here's the tricky part is not only did people not call their language what he suggested they did, um, mm. they didn't even have the same idea of what the language was. Mm. So people would speak however they spoke, and they usually spoke many different languages, um, mm. usually in part, right? They, they might pray in one language do business in another, um, sing songs in another. This is kind of a, the classic idea of polyglossia from uh, Bakhtin, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You have everyone speaking different languages and different aspects of their lives. And the idea that someone had a language that they would use for every function of their day-to-day -day life was ridiculous. And in fact, mm -hmm. at the time, it was impossible. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just wasn't something that could happen. It's something that we kind of take for granted today, largely mm. because of the success of nationalist projects that mm. put forth the idea that, oh, you should pray in the same language that you study in, that you speak to your parents in, that you use when you go to the market. And before, these were entirely different languages for most people in the world. Um, mm. The exception was pretty much uh, the French who had already gone to work at this for a while. Um, the English, roughly the same, and increasingly um, people in Germany. And this actually led to a conflict within Austria-Hungary, where you had the Austro-Hungarian emperor say, we are a backward people because we're still using Latin for our language of administration and law. Latin is a long dead language We need to modernize. We need to be like the French. We need to be like the English. And we should adopt a living language so that normal people can participate in public life. And the, I, the, the answer was, oh, that's great, but which language? And so for the Austrian parts of the empire, he said, well, we pretty much use German for everything, right? So let's, let's continue using German. For the parts of the empire that belong to Hungary, um, he said, well, you could use Hungarian. But mm -hmm. the problem is the vast majority of people who live in this greater kingdom of Hungary don't speak it. And who the fuck wants to learn Hungarian anyway? It's very right. difficult. Also, <laughs> who wants to learn Hungarian? <laughs> and, and so what did the people speak if they didn't speak Hungarian? Um, He said they speak the Illyrian dialects. Uh -huh. And so this is the thing. What is Illyria? What are these Illyrian dialects? And the funny thing is, like, you know, the, the group of languages or single language that today we would call um, Serbo-Croatian or South Slavic, you know, there's a constant bickering over the divisions, if they're the same, if they're different, how different are they, et cetera, et cetera. 
this, all these conversations, which were happening throughout the 19th century, were happening in the region. However, outside the region, it was pretty clear that it was all the same thing. Right. And they called it Illyrian. And the okay. reason they called it Illyrian is, you know, these people were classically educated, you know, worldly people, and they knew the Roman Empire, and they knew where Illyria was on the other side of the Adriatic from Italy. And they said, mm-hmm. okay, this is Illyria. And mm-hmm. the way that people talk there, they speak these different Illyrian dialects. And they didn't call the language. And the reason uh-huh. they didn't call the language was because languages were something that were written. A right, language right. was something you could use for education. It was a, a literary language. It was something you wrote books in. Um, and they looked at what we now call the South Slavic languages and just saw a mess. They saw a bunch of different styles of writing, a bunch of different orthographies. Some wrote like they were, you know, writing in Italian. Others wrote mm-hmm. using like a Hungarian orthography. Some were writing in Cyrillic. Some were writing in the Latin script. Some were writing in an even older Cyrillic script. Some were writing in the Arabic script. And there really was no standard. Right. And so th- this was a big part of the problem. Now, when, when Vuk looked at this, he said, okay, <laughs> We're going to get rid of the written part. Let's just ignore it. Because as, as Ray said uh, last time, um, Serbs at the time, especially in Austria-Hungary, were writing in this kind of half-Russian written form that barely resembled. Um, Those were like the educated like uh, Serbs. Yeah. Exactly. And oh. they, they were using letters that people didn't know. They were using words that people wouldn't know unless they were very well read, especially in Russian. And so he said, let's just get rid of that and come up with a new language based on the way people speak, um, specifically the way I, Vuk Karadzic, speak. Uh-huh. Yeah, when he said people, he meant like the lower classes, like the proletarians actually speak, not like these isolated few bourgeois kind of people that Serbs had. Exactly. mostly living in Austria. yeah, and, and even more so, it wasn't so much even the way they spoke. It was the way that they sang. <laughs> they were interested in their oral epic poetry that yeah. he diligently recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, so for him, this was like the purest Serbian language. And where was it found for him? He said the purest Serbian language was found in Bosnia, um, specifically mm-hmm. by, specifically the language used by Serbs, of the Muslim faith or of the Turkish faith, as he called it, because he identified mm-hmm. Islam with foreign, mm-hmm. um, the same way he did with uh, orthodoxy, where he called it Greek and mm-hmm. Catholicism, which he called Rome. So uh, at the core of it was this language that everyone spoke, and this was Serbian and these were Serbs. Now, as I was just saying, with, with the case of Austria-Hungary, they were looking more at written language. This was more what interested people. Um, What could be a language for education, for mobility? And as I mentioned, the emperor said, well, we can't have it be Hungarian because that doesn't make sense. People can't speak it. It's it's not even a fully elaborated language. It's it's just some kind of weird aristocratic, (laughs) you know, bizarre tongue that's spoken by this old nobility. And... In Hungary, they said, well, we can fix that. And that's what we're going to do. We'll just force everyone to learn Hungarian. All right. <laughs> Easy, right? I mean, there's really no other way of going about getting people to learn Hungarian, though. Let's be honest. Force. Brute force. Mm-hmm. Brute force. Well, I mean, lots of them, like Slavic people in the Balkans, are like who are from the parts of uh, uh, that were once Austro Hungary are today learning Hungarians or some basics of it so they would be eligible to get Hungarian citizenship mm-hmm. so they would right. become EU citizens so I mean some people are actually doing yeah, that so. there are actually many people mm-hmm. voluntarily learning yeah. Hungarian probably for the first time in centuries I, I'd say the EU counts as force though I would, yeah. I'd say yeah. uh, so mm-hmm. this actually happened at the time too and mm-hmm. Hungarian was popular at the time mm-hmm. because it gave people social no mobility, you couldn't study mm-hmm. in a Slavic language, um, yeah. certainly in a South Slavic language. 
Um, if you wanted social mobility, if you wanted to go off to uh, the capital and um, become an attorney and all this, you would learn Hungarian. And the fact that we don't even think of this is kind of a testimony to how successful it was. You look at the most common Hungarian surnames, you have Borgat. Right. And these were the people who learned Hungarian and simply mm-hmm. were given that name. You also have... Uh, what about, just to clarify, meaning Croat? Croat, yes. right. Yeah. Um, you also have, like, Tot, which is Slav, and these were people who... Tot was Slav. Right. Tot. <laughs> yeah, Tot or Sag, right? Ah, Tot or Sag. Uh, so that was uh, Slavonia. And um, so you had people actually learning Hungarian, but at the same time, you had uh, a group largely centered in Zagreb who said... This is terrible. Um, it's cool what they're doing, but first of all, it's not fair. And second of all, we should do it too. <laughs> uh, yeah, just to clarify, like with like empires as Austro-Hungary, you have a whole kind of geo- local geopolitics inside of it. Yeah. So you have like different poles to it. So first it was the Austrian Empire or the Habsburg, uh, Habsburg Empire. Then it evolved into Austro-Hungary. So it had two official like parts of it. Uh, uh, Hungarian kingdom was um, established, but the Austrian emperor was the Hungarian king. But also Hungary itself was very, um, I mean, composed of different parts. And so one of it was Croatia, which started having its own nationalist ideas. So it's a very complicated empire, as empires tend to be. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is actually a really important part that I'm sure we'll come back to, is that technically Croatia at the time was not part of the Kingdom of Hungary. Mm -hmm. They had the same king. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was the Kingdom of Hungary and the Kingdom of Croatia and several others that Mm -hmm. were collectively known as the crown lands of St. Stephen. Uh, Mm -hmm. They were multiple kingdoms with a single king. And this definitely comes back into play um, in the mid 19th century. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So at the time in early 19th century, um, you have what's called Majorizatia, which means mm-hmm. Hungarianization of uh, people in today's Croatia um, learning Hungarian and being forced to learn Hungarian. Um, it was pretty much the only option. And suddenly within this context, you have some pushback. And this is where the Illyrian movement comes into the scene. So um, starting with uh, Ludovic Guy, and then uh, the main figure at the time was uh, Janko Draskovic. Um, Draskovic put out this uh, dissertation, he called it, and it was published in a South Slavic language, written in the Latin script that had been devised by Ludovic Guy. Um, Do you know as- when was roughly this published? Uh, This would have been, I think, 1820s. Okay. Could be off a little bit, but around then. Mm -hmm. And Drashkovich said, I'm publishing this in my own tongue. And Mm -hmm. this was a big deal. Um, Mm -hmm. And he basically put forth the idea that all of these Illyrians, by which he meant South Slav, which included everyone uh, from, from Slovenia down to Bulgaria, like the entire length. Of the region. Okay. Uh, these are all one Illyrian people, and very poetically, he, he likened it to a lyre um, and said, The lyre is out of tune, and each of the strings is slightly off, and there is no accord, there is no harmony, and each one of them needs to be attuned so the lyre of Europe can once play again beautifully. And Give me the willies a bit. Some bad vibes there. <laughs> a couple of red flags. <laughs> right. We got to get everybody in tune. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Tighten them strings. All right. And and he attributed um, this this disharmony, um, this cacophony rather, as foreign influence that had pulled people in different directions. Um, Just foreign in general, or are we naming an influence here? Multiple influences. He's talking mm-hmm. about the Ottoman Empire. He's talking about um, Austria-Hungary. He's talking about 
the Italians, he's talking about the Russians, he's talking about the Catholic Church, Islam, uh, the Orthodox Church, anything that was cause for separation had kind of pulled them out of tune. And so he envisioned that with a little harmony, that the entire region would see themselves as a single people, just like everyone else did, because everyone mm. else looked at them as the Illyrians. But mm. this idea was totally foreign in the region, right? right? Like they had completely different names for themselves. They saw they divided themselves on the basis of of religion, um, nationality. You know, was much non-existent at this time. You had people identify first and foremost as their trade. You know, what, what do you do? Oh, I'm a smith. Who, who are you? I, I'm a smith from this village. What? Oh, and I'm a Christian. Like, what do you want? Yeah. <laughs> and there wasn't yeah. much like, this, is, this is pretty much a, a peasant mentality. And the idea that you're part of something called a nation, like, was entirely for it. Um, the only people that it really made sense to were lawyers at the time who were using the term uh, political people as a kind of rights-bearing subject in history. Uh, okay. These are people who swear their allegiances to a king and are established in a book. Um, so yeah, Political people. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and this is why you have kings uh, name themselves like, my name is Franz, king of the Czechs and the Slovaks and... The Hungarians and and it's funny what they get bored of listing them. So <laughs> whenever you look at the list, it usually says like uh, Czechs, Slovenes, Itakodalia, and <laughs> etc. <cetera>, yeah, <laughs> uh, and whatever. And yeah, whatever. you know all those peoples <laughs> that I'm a king of. Just focus on king. That's what I want you yeah, to see here. Exactly. So um, so anyway, like you you have this pushback happening where the Illyrians are saying okay and. It was a group of people who were forming at this time saying, basically giving an idea for what we would now call Yugoslavism. They wanted to unite all the South Slavic peoples. And that's how they were perceived in Yugoslavia as a kind of first Yugoslavia, ideologues of Yugoslavism. Right. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that legacy is now challenged um, in, in Croatian. Um, the movement is generally referred to as um, the Croatian renewal, right? Mm. Um, and this kind of follows what the Hungarians have done, where they also had their renewal movement. Mm. And so with the Illyrians, you had this broad idea, oh, let's just get everyone in tune. And one of the ways that you could do this was having um, the writers from different regions come together and agree to read the same books and to write the same way, at least use the same script and the same dialect in their writing and kind of create a national language. And Shout out to all the Benedict Anderson fans out there. <laughs> <laughs> right. And like and subscribe. <laughs> and what's great is like they're very clear where they got this idea. In the dissertation, they said, look at what the Hungarians are doing. <laughs> Said, yeah, look at what they did. They got rid of all the German words in their language. And how did they fill the gaps? Well, they they looked over to a uh, secondly and and found like these old peasant words that survived on the fringe and said, OK, now we found a proper Hungarian word. So we'll put that in. And if we can't find like a, a real Hungarian word, we'll just make one up. And that's exactly <laughs> what the Illyrian was. Well, that explains a lot. Yeah, And so now what was interesting in, in, in this period is like they, they wanted to find this kind of pure language that wasn't full of all these foreign words. And, you know, they, the, the easiest way to do that was to turn to the specific literature of the city of Dubrovnik. Because Dubrovnik, unlike the rest of the region, wasn't subject to foreign power for a very long time. Um, they remained an independent city-state until uh, Napoleon. Right. They had no. been a competitor to Venice and, yeah. you know, have this very long history of... So, Ragusia, yeah, the, any Civ, Civ fans out there, it's... Yeah, yeah it's, it's a city-state. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
they're, they're gives cultured. you that. You can gift them some gold and win over. Yeah, <laughs> they give you a mercantile bonus. Yeah. I think, don't they? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, in this period where most of uh, the coastal region had, had long been part of Venice, while the inland part had been, you know, either Austro-Hungarian or Ottoman, um, they looked at Dubrovnik as the city-state that had its own flourishing native literature. And they said, okay, we're going to take this language as the basis um, because it has, you know, this lexical wealth to it. We can, we can find old words that aren't like recent borrowings from German or Italian, Hungarian. And so we'll, we'll turn to this region. And that's exactly what they did. However, uh, in this dissertation, he also spells out another reason why this is the ideal language to choose. And this reason is it's the most widely spoken. And he names all of the regions that speak this. He says, you, you look at uh, the military frontier, um, the Voiska Krajina, and this is the language that they speak there. This is the language they speak in this area along the river Kupa. This is the language they speak in Slavonia. And above mm. all, this is the language they speak in Bosnia, and let us all unite and hopefully re- all right. uh, bring Bosnia back into our bosom, as he says. And, and this was the mm. thing. All these regions mm. he's naming are mm. part of Austria-Hungary, with the exception of Bosnia. And so Bosnia is where the most pure Croatian is used, and from the moment of... But he doesn't mention like Serbia or Montenegro. No. no. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very much about Bosnia, and mm-hmm. I say Croatian. He's he says Illyrian. I want to clarify. Mm-hmm. Um, he says, "Let's unite and bring Bosnia back, because this is the heartland." And so, from from the inception of the movement, um, they have eyes on Bosnia. Like this is what they're going for. Now, there was always the question of how the Illyrian movement dealt with Serbs. Um, because obviously when they're espousing this broad national idea of all South Slavs, where do Serbs fit into the picture? Because here you have um, Vuk essentially making counterclaims to the same groups of people, saying, oh, all of Bosnia, these are Serbs. And um, Croats are only in this region here and Slovenes are there. Vuk never talks about Illyrians because... He's more interested in how, you know, the, the folk think of themselves. He doesn't care about, you know, these foreign concepts of, you know, this outsider perspective that they're all one people. Um, for him, it's an artificial mm-hmm. and it's brought in from the outside. Uh, and, I guess also brought in from more of an elite perspective as well. Yes, absolutely. So these are like the, the educated literate Catholics, especially, who are using the term Illyrian. Mm-hmm. So it had long been used by the Roman Catholic Church, as well as Austria. And Vuk says, okay, no, no. Um, the real name of the people is Serb, and the Serbs live in this region. Croats are something else, and they, they live in this one little part here. And the Slovenes are here, but the, the truth is the majority of people are just totally confused. Okay. And it's my heavy duty as a linguist to tell them what they don't want to hear. Oh, and he's guy. like, I know that Serbs of the Catholic faith don't want to be told that they're Serbs, but I got to do it. And, you know, the, the Serbs of Turkish faith, they call themselves Turks. Sorry, Serbs. And uh, this, this was all put forth in an essay called... Sorry, you're a Serb. Yeah, we know it. Basically, it was a Serbi Svi Svude. Serbs all and everywhere. <laughs> so, um, Which would eventually become true. Migration joke. And uh, he also talked about, uh, you know, the historical Croats are down along the coast in this area. Um, what about the people in Zagreb? Um, he called them Danasni Hrvati, like today's Croats. He said, yeah, today's Croats in Zagreb is complicated. Um, they speak Hykovian, so they're Slovenes, <laughs> but they kind of talk like Serbs. And so 
He's like, yeah, it's, not good. it's a bunch of Slovenes who talk like Serbs who call themselves Croats <laughs> because they're confused. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and the reason they're confused, he, he had a great explanation for this. Um, the reason they're confused is that there's a what he identified as a nasty habit among Catholics to identify themselves with the political entity that they live in instead of the real national group. And so people who live in this entity called Croatia are calling themselves Croats because that's what Catholics do. They're just kind of wrong. And um, later, like uh, 200 years later, Vojislav Šešel took up the same theme and actually said, yes, this is exactly right. However, it's more of a criminal conspiracy of the Catholic Church to create an artificial (laughs) nation. But he agreed with the basic premise. That, well, let's keep let's keep Shesha for later. That's a different arc. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but I mean, um, this is like the, the, the it's interesting the thing that he says they are confused because like if you are you if he was a nationalist, so if you have a nationalist perspective, this is a perspective <laughs> that wants like the population to be homogenized. And if you like he did, lived in a time where still nations are not really formed. Mm-hmm. The populations are like very heterogeneous. So like from a, if you adopt a nationalist ideology, things do look like they're confused, you know, yeah. because they're s- still not produced as a nation. Like they speak dialects, not like standardized languages. They don't have one ethnic identity and so on. So like, yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting that he thinks they are confused. Yeah. So when a yeah. nationalist tells you you're confused, say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. So... For for him, like, you know, the, the people in Belgrade were also confused. They're confused Serbs. Well, I mean, everyone is confused from that perspective, no, not at that time. This is the interesting thing. Mm. In Belgrade, they're confused because they're speaking Ekavian. Yeah. Ekavian belongs with Kaikavian. And mm. it somehow came over from mixing with the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They should be speaking Ie because that's the proper Serbian dialect. Mm. And so the only... The only people who aren't confused in his conception are Serbs of the Serbian Orthodox faith who have maintained the name Serb and also speak Iakavian, Stokavian dialect, which means Serbs in Bosnia and the one little part of Serbia that he is from. Which (laughs) is literally on what's today the border of Serbia and Croatia. I mean, his the village where he's from is on pretty much on the Drina River. And yeah, so, Serbia and Bosnia. Yeah, Serbia and yeah. Bosnia, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Did and at the, time it, it, <laughs> at the time, it was Bosnia. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it actually didn't get sent over to Serbia until an agreement sometime later. Uh, one of a few counties that were contested. Oh, right, but, um, in the uprising in, um, yeah. in Bosnia. So in the, he's actually the from, yeah, from yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, The heavy truth, Vuk is Bosnia. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, anyway, so you have um, these, these people contesting this and saying, okay, let's, let's instead look at written language and find a common written language that we can all use and this will be like the basis for having a modern nation of having a language that you can use in education and um, in, in law and every aspect of life, a modern national tongue. And this is kind of what the Illyrians were hoping to put together. And uh, it was actually in 1850 that some representatives from the Illyrian movement got together with Vuk. Um, and his his acolyte, Juro, and they got together in Vienna and hammered out an agreement, uh, a, a gentleman's agreement between scholars, mm-hmm. and came to a set of conclusions that said, we both know we're talking about the same people, <laughs> right? We both know that. And <laughs> let's let's come to some agreement as to which dialect is best, they decided on the southern dialect, which is the one around Dubrovnik and widely spoken in, in Bosnia um, and Montenegro. Or Herzegovina, right? Yeah. That kind of. So is this particular region down south. That's, that's the best version of this language. And they didn't name the language in the document. Uh, this is 
uh, you know, I, I think that's intentional. I, I don't think they could come to terms on that. <laughs> and so they left the language unnamed. They said, we're talking about one people, one language. Let's come up with some rules. Um, we won't use H after the genitive plural and so forth that some wanted. Um, Vuk didn't want to use uh, H at all. He said it didn't mm. properly exist in Serbian. And mm. it was a concession to include it. <laughs> um, and, you know, they, they came up with a few other rules. Um, how to write ye um, when it's short versus long. And they, they put out this Vienna literary agreement in 1850. And um, so the Illyrians were actually enthusiastic supporters of Vuk. And this okay. is the, they got along great. And um, Vuk, he didn't live too much longer, but uh, his acolyte Juro um, came to... Zagreb. That's uh, Juro Danicic? Or... Yes. Yeah. Okay. So in this time, uh, Vuk's reforms to the Serbian language were considered, you know, unwelcome within Serbia itself. And especially within um, Novi Sad, right? You had this uh, organization, Matica Srpska, that was about preserving this old, you know, Serbian written tradition that Vuk wanted to throw away. And he wanted to go with, you know, this kind of folk poetry and um, written in a dialect that they didn't even speak up there. And so he actually got more support from Zagreb than he got in Serbia. And he also got support um, in Montenegro, um, where you had uh, the, I, I forgot how he's called in English, uh, Bishop Prince uh, Niegos. Yeah, I think going? I think the that's the Sick going title. title. Yeah, Bishop Prince. Yeah, um, he's like, oh, cool. You need a an entirely new literature based on the dialect that I speak and write in. I just happen to have, <laughs> you know, a printing press and a book I just wrote, and it seems to fit exactly what you're talking about. And so Gorski Vienna's kind of became this foundational epic for the Serbian written tradition uh-huh. um, because uh, he was backing Vuk at a time when no one was. Um, and it's I mean, about genocide. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, it is about genocide of the Muslim population um, committed by his ancestor that he's writing an apology for. Mm. Um, totally justifying it, of course. Mm. And so he was able to get in on the ground floor of Serbian literature um, by playing his cards right. Well, while Juro was sent to Zagreb and kind of worked with uh, people in Zagreb to come up with, you know, uh, a harmonized standard language for the region. Now, uh, for for various reasons, largely because of um, oppression from Austria-Hungary, uh, the Illyrian movement officially fell apart and was closed down. Um, the Illyrian reading room um, there was Matica Ilirska, which um, was closed and, and shuttered. And a lot of politicians who had been active in the Illyrian movement were arrested. Um, not all of them. A lot of them were very influential and high up people who, who didn't suffer such fate. Um, yeah, it's just interesting how, I mean, how back then they had this kind of common sense uh, way of thinking, just acknowledging, okay, we are talking about the same people. We agree on this. Maybe we don't call them the same. They have maybe don't have the, uh, exactly the same ideas about everything, but we are talking about the same people. Exactly. And it's interesting how these uh, ideologues of nationalism thought like this uh, then and today, when in a way all of these people living in the Balkans in these areas are even more so, you could say, the same people. In uh, like quotation marks, mm-hmm. especially because now they speak uh, co- like a standardized language, which uh, which these people in the 19th century created. Mm-hmm. Right now, uh, nationalist ideologues, especially Croatian ones, are like pretending that this is not the same language and these are completely <laughs> different people. And it's kind of and and they are much more the same than they were at that time. <laughs> right, because is... at, at that time you would have had so much more regional variation. Right, where you know somebody. Yeah. Even with mm. within what's today Serbia would have you know difficulty understanding one another if somebody was from you know the far south yeah. and you know what's the Vojvodina speaking essentially yeah you know, a different language yeah. <laughs> and this is kind of like the the sick irony of the whole 
Croatian Serbian thing is at, at its core, it's really an argument about which movement that says we're all the same and speak the same language <laughs> put aside our religious divisions should we go for? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Meeting unity yeah. movements. We're all the same I mean, people. Yeah. Fuck you, I know. That's what it was historically, I would say. Uh, yeah. It's like, but it changed somehow in the 20th century and then Croatian nationalism uh, kind of mutated in something different that wanted to differentiate itself from the Serbs more so. I would oh. say the 19th century was more like you would say. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, today among Croatian nationalism, this idea of, you know, they don't say what Serbs say, or they are just, you know, in Serbs, they these are like Orthodox Serbs. Like, they don't, it's not so much a Croatian thing. No, no, definitely not. Yeah. And um, we'll, we'll get to that point. So... Oh, Orthodox Croats, sorry. That's yeah, funny. there was a period of time in which that was used as a concession, but yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, in fact, let's get there now. This is a good time to introduce mm. one Dr. Ante Starcevic. All right. Mm. So, I have to say, Ante Starcevic was a brilliant, brilliant, really an incredibly well-read, intelligent person. We're talking uh, like Jordan Peterson levels here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Quite, quite. Wow. <laughs> um, he followed all the rules for life. <laughs> Every single one of them. <laughs> Starting with cleaning his room. And you know what? It was the key to his success to become the father of the nation. <laughs> that um, works. So, but I, I want to preface this. Um, I personally, and I'm not the only one here, I think Starcevich gets a kind of bad rap and he gets a bad rap among a lot of people, but essentially it's like this. Well, hold on. Let's maybe explain first who he is and then. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So here's the thing for Serbian nationalists, Starcevich is seen as an arch nationalist Croat buckhead who supports <laughs> the genocide of Serbian people. Mm-hmm. Okay. For Croatian nationalist, he is an arch nationalist Croatian fuckhead who also supports the genocide of the Serbian people. They completely <laughs> agree. And this is the thing. It's kind of like, you know, uh Richard Dawkins and the Islamic State. Uh-huh. You know, you put it together and they're both like insisting that the only correct interpretation of Islam is, you know, some barbaric set of practices. <laughs> And anyone who disagrees with it should be killed. However, <laughs> yeah, um, Dawkins. Yeah. However, Dawkins doesn't support it, while the Islamic State does. But uh-huh. they both agree that that is the proper way to right, uh, right. I see. Grab Islam. And anyone who doesn't do that is not a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. It's basically like this. So you have like Croatian nationalists well, today. First of all, can you can you give us a little bit of background on? who Stacevic is. Oh, um, I'll give you a lot of background. On <laughs> I'll give you plenty. That's what you're plenty. here for, Kamal. <laughs> Kamal's but, weaving us a web. You know? Just to preface yeah. this with, uh, you know, there's a consensus between uh, Croatian nationalists and Serbian nationalists that Stacevic was a genocidal maniac. Okay. And um, uh, I think this would have come as a, a surprise to him. So, and and the part of this is because he was such a skilled and popular politician that a lot of people tried to latch onto his legacy, um, namely Josip Trump. So, uh, Starcevic. Um, Starcevic was born in uh, Gospic, um, which is a a town in in Lika, um, kind of in in the southern part of Croatia. And um, it was the military frontier at the time. And he was born of a Roman Catholic father and a Serbian Orthodox mother, Milica. And so he comes from, you know, a a mixed background, at least religiously. And he decided to, um, he, he wanted to go into the seminary for a while. And so he was studying theology and then decided to just study law. And so he was very well read in, in Latin, in Greek, and he taught himself numerous other languages. And he got involved with uh, 
the Illyria movement. However, he had some strong disagreements with certain trends in the Illyrian movement and strong disagreements with Vuk Kanakic. Um, now, a lot of these disagreements are kind of pedantic, but for him, they were important and they would prove to be important later on. So Starchevich also believed in this pan-South Slavic unity. And for him, there were only two South Slavic nations the Bulgarians and the Croats. And he said, everyone from, you know, this part in Italy uh, around uh, Corinthia, all the way down to Bulgaria, these are all Croats. And again, for similar reasons that, that Vuk was saying, he said, a lot of these people are confused because they call themselves different. Um, he said, the proper name is Croat. However, a lot of them call themselves Serbs. And he had a simple explanation for this. As I said, he was a, a very well-read person and a philologist. And he said, well, it turns out uh, Serb comes from the term servus, which means a slave. And these people were the, the slaves of Constantine. This is who the Serbs were. They are Croats who had become servants of Constantine doing his bidding, and they're basically the Byzantine branch of the Croatian nation. And he also came up with this term Slava Serbs. Oh, yeah. And exp- no, and ex- that's totally yeah. separate. But, um, uh, okay. Yeah. But so- that all, he also explained that this also means that both words also mean slave, like yeah. Slav and Serb. So they, he was basically calling them slave slaves. Like slavey slaves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Slaves. So... So the, the, the old term for slave, uh, the Latin mm. term um, mm. in Greek before that was servus. Mm. In some dialects, like in the Eastern Romance languages, it becomes servus. Mm. And he said, this is slave. Mm. And over time in Latin, they abandoned servus and adopted slavus because mm. the majority of the slaves that they were selling were Slavs and called mm. themselves Slavs. And so they started just saying slave, which means slav, right? Mm. And so you you have these words in close proximity to each other um, with r- describing roughly the same people of slave mm. and serve. And, you know, you have little variations of this. Um, in, in modern Italian, it'd be uh, schiavo is mm. slave. In Venetian, it got shortened um, and... Here along the, the coast of the Adriatic, you would have uh, Schiavo becoming Chao. And so Ciao. the old greeting, uh, Servus, you know, I'm, I'm here to serve you. Servus, um, it's also Hungarian. This got shortened to Chao <laughs> in the Adriatic <laughs> to identify yourself as a friendly, right? Like, I'm, I'm here to serve you. I'm not here to attack you. And so it became a greeting of identifying. Oh, so, okay. So, I know, because I know some Croatian, uh, I, I uh, know about some Croatian nationalist idiots uh, <laughs> who like think that because they invented in the nineties this term uh, like uh, "bog" uh, in uh, in Croatia, which is like this cr- proper way to say hi, uh, and then people who say "ciao" in some parts, these nationalist idiots they identify "ciao" as a Serbian greeting. Oh. So, but in a way, you say it's. Um, <laughs> They were right in some way. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that. No, you you got to be really careful how you how you say hi. I mean, yeah. in certain parts in Dalmatia, you say ciao. People will be like, "Dude, you sound like a Serb." And you, <laughs> so, oh, especially me. some years back too. You could... <laughs> yeah, and Not then you say, so, but... uh, "Excuse me, a uh, bulk," and they're like, "Ooh, that sounds really Zagreb." <laughs> And then you're like, shit, a uh, zdravo. And they're like, what are you, a commie? <laughs> no. What do you uh, say? <laughs> Bog with a G, I think, is the, oh, okay. the one that passes. So just God? Uh, yeah. yeah. Just say God to people. Scott. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Sure. That's perfectly normal. <laughs> I mean, we shorten God be with you to goodbye. So. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Kimmel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, goodbye. Um, I'm going to stick with Chow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm your slave. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but do it with like one fist up in the air, you know? Mean yeah. It. No. 
Just so, retaking so it, retaking yeah. Chow for <laughs> the, the masses. <laughs> so Sarcevich was like, okay, Slav, Serb, these are just like slave names. And the only proper name is actually Croat. But unlike... What does you know, Croat mean? It means bow tie. According to him. Well, no, it means a long time, um, doesn't it? You would say it's like the <laughs> ancient proper name of it, uh, of you know the ethnic group. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, from from some research that I did, uh, apparently it also means slave. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, like, uh, uh, like uh, sarvati, which means to like can mm. to preserve or watch over. In the ancient mm. Iranian languages, and uh, S becomes H, so you get mm -hmm. as like the people who are enslaved. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> he uh, so he thought Croat was the good one. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he thought pretty much everyone were Croats except for the ones who were Bulgarians in terms of you know, the South Slavs, and he opposed Vuk's idea. But the the important thing is. He actually didn't care what people called themselves. He found it funny. Um, uh, he found them stupid, but he didn't really care. And, and one of the things that he says repeatedly is like, because he's a philologist, by the way, um, he would say, look, people call the this language Serbian, the Stokavian, Iakavian language. They're calling it Serbian now. Um, I hate to tell you, we have 700 years of written evidence that shows it's been called Croatian. Like, sorry. Serbian always describes something else, and that's fine that you wanted to get rid of it. It was artificial anyway. Cool. But the, what you're writing in now, this is Croatian, mm -hmm. and we have plenty of documentary evidence. And so this was his stance on Croatian, that there was this one broad language, and it was called Croatian. And he actually didn't care what other people called it. And he would joke about this. Um, he would say, oh, I don't care if they call it Coptic. Go oh. ahead. Um, when he talked about people who identified as Serbs, he goes, fine, they're Croats. They call themselves Serbs. They can do that if they want. They can call themselves Hops and Tots for all I care. And this is all from his stand-up routines? This is from his stand-up routines. Um, Man. It sounds very Serbian. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, these hot and tots. Um, well, tots. So this is this is where he said, he's like, okay, they're all Croats, whatever. Again, like he said, Catholic, Orthodox, Muslim, it doesn't matter. Like, we're not looking at the level of religion. And interestingly for him, um, just like Vuk said, the, the purest of the, of the Serbian speakers are... Serbs of Turkish faith in Bosnia. Um, for Starcevich, the best Croats, the flower of the Croatian nation, were the Bosnian Muslims. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't they just uh, agree on being Bosnians? <laughs> yeah. on the that? <laughs> it seems, like, it seems like the logical one there, yeah. yeah. Um, but that makes you sound like a Bosnian nationalist, I'm afraid. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, if they if they uh, both thought that like the Bosnians are the pure Serbs slash Croats, yeah, right. Why does not be Bosnian? Everybody wants to be yeah. a Bosnian. No one wants to be a Bosnian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, a big part of it was like Bosnia was a region, mm. and they didn't even say the word Bosansi at the time, mm. like Bosnians. They said Bosniaks. Um, mm. They said Bosniaci, and mm. Bosniak is the Turkish word for someone from Bosnia. Mm -hmm. And so it just seemed a bit too exotic for them, I think. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for something older and ancestral and all. Mm -hmm. um, so especially... they, solved it, they solved it by saying Bosnia is actually Serbia or Bosnia is actually Croatia. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So this was the way out. And they didn't see I die on it. We should inform the listener who can't see what we see that behind Kamal right now is a beautiful landscape painting of the Bosnian pyramids. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the second time I think they've snuck onto the show. <laughs> Pyramid of Light in Yusufa. Yeah, we're, so, we're going to have to cover this, I think, at some to. point. It's a sign. Just, um, yeah. Pyramid of the it's Sun. It's coming. 
there are two, the sun and the moon pyramid. We, 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 can, we can do a, a show excursion out there. Maybe Camel will want to oh, come yeah. out. Come Let's out do with it. Us. Let's take we'll, the tour. We'll visit the... Maybe we can interview Samit Osmanagic and be like, what the fuck is wrong with you, dog? <laughs> <laughs> Another Texas boy. Also, Visoko has become like the center of New Age in Bosnia. There's like vegan restaurants and shit. Oh, yeah, of course, because people actually believe it's real. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can check out is the it ashram. Uh, is it true that uh, Starchevich's mother was Serbian? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's from Lika. I mean, mm-hmm. it's Orthodox. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at least that's what, what I understood. Mm-hmm. Um, Mila or Milica. Mm-hmm. Um, so. So Starcevich said that the Bosnian Muslims are, are the best mm. among the Croats, the flower of the Croatian nation. Why would he say that? And this is the funny thing. He wasn't going by linguistic evidence or anything like that. It was because for him, the, the Catholics were basically sellouts to the Roman Catholic Church. And they were pawns. They were dupes. And the Orthodox, again, you know, they adopted the Greek faith and they were clinging to their faith and everything. The Muslims, he said, these were Christians who totally abandoned one foreign religion and adopted another when the Turks came just to maintain rule over themselves. And, and this is brilliant. That's good. It's great. Okay. He's like, right. So you fake good. it once, boo. If you fake it twice, mm. bro. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. He said they're all foreign religions. What are you talking about? Like, there isn't some national religion here. Not and yet. so they got rid of Christianity, adopted Islam, whatever, so that they can maintain their rule. And because they never, like, sold out in, in the sense of, like, becoming subservient to the foreign power, they were ideal. They, they were the best. Um, they could cast aside Christianity as a... a historical accretion to maintain national rule. So, I mean, his mind, like, okay, he was, like, anti-clerical, so <laughs> religion was, like, something that you could, like, was instrumental, but uh, in his mind, Bosnian Muslims, like, stuck to what was important, which is being Croat, I guess. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Except, yeah, yeah. They're like, wait, so we we're second class citizens but if we just mm. get rid of this one religion and take another then we can be on top again mm. great and he thought that was you know brilliant like mm. why would you not do that yeah now, in the <laughs> narrative you know it's like oh they betrayed christ to rule <laughs> on earth may they choke on their serbian mother's milk <laughs> That's from Yegos, by the way. Um, <laughs> choke on their serving mother's milk. And that guy's on money. Like, no, good for you guys. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> bravo. No, that's clever. Yeah, way to game the system. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He thought the the Muslims were the best Croats because they abandoned Christianity to rule. And uh, the same thing that, you know, Serbian nationalists would blame them for as being bad right. Serbs. He said and made them good Croats, actually the best Croats. It was, you know, that's smart. And um, so, yeah, Ray brings up this point about, like, what was Starcevich's position vis-a-vis the church? Because, you know, he's, he's remembered as, you know, the father of the Croatian nation. And Croatia, as many of you know, is one of the most Catholic countries in the world. Um, they take it very, very seriously in general. And... Um, in the press, Starcevic was smeared as the Antichrist, oh. which is a term he adopted lovingly and said, yeah, fine, right. that works for me. Uh, um, an early Marilyn Manson type. Yeah, exactly. Um, he, he doesn't seem to have been an atheist, from what I understand, um, but he definitely wasn't a fan of foreign churches or foreign anything. Really. <laughs> so Starcevich's idea was that you needed to have a Croatian state, and that would be the state of the Croatian people. And as I've already said, Croatian for him is a very broad term that encompasses um, pretty much what we today know as Yugoslavs in general. And for him, um, there, there were certain barriers standing in the way of the creation of this Croatian state. Um, one of them was foreign influence. Um, 
Um, it was the influence from Vienna and, you know, uh, Russia and the Ottoman Empire and so forth. Um, but even worse for him were the people themselves, the Croats. They were the ones who were at fault for this. And um, he, he was a polemicist, right? And he was active politically. He founded a political party um, based on his ideas for a Croatian state. It's called the, the Party of Right and um, also transcended as Party of Rights sometimes. Mm -hmm. But the idea is basically that, you know, he is an attorney. He looked into it, as did a bunch of others, and said, guess what? Croatia is a separate kingdom from Hungary. We don't take orders from Hungary. It is not cool. And the, the emperor in Vienna is our emperor simply because the Croatian people swore allegiance to him when it was still the king of Hungary at the time, of course. Um, so it was this, this swearing of allegiance that as a political people, they have the right to withdraw at any time. I love this. And, Guys, I looked into it and you'll never guess what I found. Kind of <laughs> no, this, there. Yeah. this is very much <laughs> this like, shit is uh, going to blow your mind. Of, yeah. This is like the whole Texas kind of thing. Like, <laughs> oh, we can leave at any time we want. Right. This is pretty much what it is. Where he's saying, guess what? We already are a free people and we are bound by legal contracts. And because of this, we have the legal right to have our own state. If, if we're not happy with the current arrangement, as a free people, we have the right to leave this arrangement and form a new one. And the idea is who is in charge of the fate of Croatia? God and the Croatians. Bog i Hrvat. And this was, I mean, it's obviously taken from Italian nationalism, you know, God and the people. Um, Which, as we've seen in... in Previous episodes was also important in development of certain strands of Serbian nationalism as well. I mean, Italy factors pretty heavily into a lot of things happening in the region. Absolutely. Yeah. So for him, it's this idea that it's God and the Croats who alone are, you know, in charge of Croatia's fate. And the problem is a lot of Croats did not agree with him. And he considered them to be some of the vilest figures of the time. And he gave them dirty names. He, he played around. Uh, he, he wrote like kind of satirical plays and stuff about. No, these I said we're, we're talking about Sheshe later. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, one of, one of these groups that he talked about were the Majorolzi. And there's like the Majoroni who were, the Delicious. the Macaroni were like um, this the political party that was backing Macarizatia Hungarianization, and these were like the elite aristocrats. And he said these people are scum. Uh, the Macarozzi, these are the people who are backing this project from inside Croatia. These are people who have sold out their countrymen. Um, to the interest in Vienna and Tirol, and the, these people are traitors. These are, are scum who have betrayed the nation. They weren't the only ones. These were the people at the top. They're also like peasant groups. Um, so the Madrilotsi were, I think, the People's Party at the time. Um, then you had the the Hungarianist Party, who were the Madrilotsi, and then you had the people that he described as the Slavo Serbi. And these people were also scum. Right? These were people who were basically, again, another kind of imperial stooge who were betraying the nation at the behest of Russia and aligning the country with what he saw as basically this Russian puppet state that existed within the Ottoman Empire at the time, which is Serbia. <laughs> and so he saw all these different factions within the Croatian political scene and described them all as like, you know, he, he talked about them as like vile breeds, the, the shit of the nation. And, you know, it was all this kind of political tract 
Um, very. I, heard, I mean, yeah. I think the rap that he has a, as a genocidal maniac has to do with this, and also some of the solutions that he proposed. No, for no. So this is where the the legacy of of him as a genocidal maniac comes in. Um, he was actually not a violent person and does not seem to have advocated violence at any point. But he talked about the Slavo Serbi as, you know, a particular kind of Croat who are imperial stooges on behalf of Russia and supporting some kind of um, some kind of political union with with Serbia, um, with the state of Serbia. And over time and by over For time, I mean, rather quickly um, after his death, the term Slavo Serbi was recontextualized from its original context, where it referred to a political faction within 19th century politics, and it was racialized to refer to Serbian people, um, which he didn't even believe existed, right? He wouldn't mm. talk about Serbian people as a people. For him, they were God. And so he never actually spoke about Serbs as like a people he talked about the serbian state and he talked about uh these slavo serbi as like a a political trend within croatia yeah but i mean uh, that's uh, you know okay so fritz mentioned sheshel a few times which is a contemporary serbian nationalist ideal he also doesn't believe that croats exist but no he me, does he just thinks that they're the ones like yeah like yeah, i mean but he uh, believes that most of croats are not croats yeah uh most people who identify as croats are not croats but i mean um that doesn't uh, mean that he doesn't add like you know when he talks i mean most of the like uh this kind of genocidal um ideology that comes from the point of view of Serbian nationalism is about people who are not actually Croats or Turks, but Serbs who forgot that they are, who think they are Croats or Turks. Right. So, I mean, that doesn't, in, in, in case of Stalcevic, I mean, the fact that he considered some of these worst Croats to be Slavo Serbs doesn't mean that, it doesn't um, negate the possibility of him being in some kind of um for some kind of a genocidal ideology i mean didn't he um pro- i mean in his rhetorics doesn't he didn't he say things like this like that an x is the solution for the problem of slava serbs in croatia and such things um i i've heard that i haven't seen that one um i wouldn't be surprised if it were there i mean it's but... it's kind of the same way if you're looking at Njegos, right if you consider mm-hmm. that to be kind of proto-genocidal text yeah. then that you I think I mean for me like um, in that realm as well this, like I wouldn't I mean this is like I wouldn't call him a genocidal maniac but I would call him like a genocidal gentleman which is like <laughs> what I would call also Njegos or Vuk or any of these fuckers who are like ideologues of like a nation as a kind of a homogenous entity uh, because that's I mean if, if you have this kind of politics combined with state building i mean, genocide is like it's an. In, in, I mean, it's a inherent part of that politics, in my view. I Absolutely, mean. yeah. One of the things that I find curious, though, about maybe Stachuch is mm-hmm. the recognition of Bulgarians, right? What to him? I don't know if if you know much about this, but what to him separates Bulgarians so much from from Serbs, right? If they, I mean, they're Orthodox South Slavic people. Why not just make all Serbs in what's today Serbia Bulgarians? I suspect it's uh, a <laughs> like, and, So it's a, it's purely a linguistic declensions. Right? Uh, declensions. I think so. Difference I, in I think language that's between the, the main thing there. Um, you know, it, it is a hard a hard line uh, find, right? Like obviously they're the ones drawing, and right. you can always move um, the criteria a little bit. To, to push the line a little further. And this is actually one of the things, right, where, you know, Vuk himself um, said, Iakavian is the purest Serbian. And one of the reasons that you actually have this, this push for Ekavian um, is, is not so much to do with, oh, that's the way that Belgrade speaks and that's like the best way. Um, 
It actually had more to do with the politics in Macedonia at the time and making this argument that Macedonian is at its core Serbian. And it's been covered up with a, what they call it, international bullock um, that just needs to be scraped off, this kind of foreign mud that's accumulated on top of the Serbian core of the language. And so, like, you have this shift in saying, okay, um, Macedonian, you know, it's at this point where it could go either way between Bulgarian or Serbian, and you have arguments being made at the time, even at the price of saying, okay, well, then the proper way to do Serbian is this way that's actually more like um, Macedonian. Hmm. And um, this was actually one of the reasons why uh, Vuk's supporters went against Vuk later, um, because he said it had to be Diakot, not Diakot. And so the language actually became more distant from that point um, from Bosnia and Croatia. And this happened, I believe, around um, the late 1870s, which is when um, Bosnia suddenly was no longer part, I mean, officially it was, but um, technically no longer part of the Ottoman Empire and had come under Austro-Hungarian rule. And it was a matter of like, okay, well, if we're out to liberate further Serbian lands from the Ottoman Empire, I guess we have to look south at this point rather than west. Right. And so these linguistic boundaries, you know, that's kind of the nature of language. You know, it, it's this continuum. And the people who are drawing the lines, especially in this time period, are doing it with the explicit idea that we are drawing national boundaries that should be transposed as political boundaries. And so this is the kind of thing. Um, to go back to, to Ray's point, though, um, yeah, it's difficult to to figure out Starchevich's role in in the later genocide that would happen and to say if he's proto-genocidal or not and or ethnocidal and so forth. I, I can see where that's a slippery subject, especially because the people who, who followed him, um, especially Josip Frank and his successors with Dilsev, deliberately took up the mantle of of Starchevich. They said, we are the party of Starchevich. And these are Starchevich's ideas. And it, it becomes increasingly difficult to distinguish, you know, his ideas from those who claim to espouse them and act on them with that in mind. Um, this has been an issue in Croatian historiography um, for, for decades now, um, where it's actually largely uh, Croatian Jewish authors um, who, who have been working on this issue, like uh, Evil Goldstein. Um, and, and these are the people who are kind of doing work on Sarcevic's legacy to find out to what extent he actually embraced racist language um, and conceived of, of race in this kind of uh 19th century racial perspective he was it's, also an anti-semite no like i think yeah definitely an anti-semite. okay then study over yeah. <laughs> call, call him up but i mean um i i was certainly i'm not what i was saying uh, i'm not trying to say that i think starchevich is an ustasha and uh, the same i wouldn't say like you know vuk is a chetnik like that's ridiculous to say but i would say that they are nationalists you know and that and, and that nationalist project I mean, uh, like, I see them as completely connected to, I think that eventually they result in some kind of genocidal politics, you know, even if... not agree more. So this is what I'm like, this is why I'm not, uh, you know... Yeah, it's a logical progression yeah. from, from I mean, one to the other. This is mm -hmm. like, I'm just like, oh, I'm not, this is why I'm not only like describing myself as an anti-fascist, but also as an anti-nationalist. I think these are, yeah, yeah, so that's basically, yeah. Tomorrow, yeah. leftist Facebook is going to be covered in Starcevic uh, yeah. debates. I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> Where do we get to Gotovina? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean, no. and also, I mean, it's interesting, like, to because he was a, a liberal. So, I mean, and, and nationalism. I mean, we talked about this a little bit right. in the previous episode. How much nationalism is a liberal uh, idea, and in some way, you can say a left idea uh, in the in the in the time when it was conceived. Uh, as a kind of anti-aristocratic idea, as an egalitarian idea. 
but the problem with it that it wants to create some, some kind of a homogeneous discrete population that's very different from the ones that are like bordering it and also you need to i mean how do you create a homogeneous <laughs> population i mean also you can still have bosses yeah yeah i mean yeah the, the ways you create that are something that we have we are going to continue to cover i think in this podcast i, mean, I, I imagine so uh, i mean yeah, yeah for me the point is not to say that 19th century ideologues of nationalism are like fascist it the point is to say that on the contrary they are liberals but you end up in fascism eventually yeah i mean yeah. that's exactly how they saw themselves they they actually saw themselves in 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 these terms of like we're throwing off the chains of imperialism yeah. um we're we're uniting the people and um Unfortunately, you know, our, our land is also full of other people who uh, aren't part of this nation. And um, we'll have to find ways to deal with that, too. And this is the the elephant in the room at all mm. at all points. Like, you know, even in the, the most generous understanding of Yugoslavia, it is explicitly within the name itself yeah. a South Slav state, which, yeah, mm-hmm. for example, like, excludes, yeah, excludes say Albanians, which there are yeah, more Roma. more of them than there are Slovenes, you know, <laughs> Italians, Italians, mm-hmm. Roma people who just mm-hmm. aren't Slavs. Um, yeah, I mean, they it creates you know national minorities to have a nation state. It's inherent in the concept, and and for them this was a price that they were willing to pay. In terms of Starchevich and his anti-Semitism, yes, he was anti-Semitic, like everyone else in the 19th century, except for the, well, including some Jews. Um, but yeah, he was vehemently anti-Semitic, and it was, as, as usual, um, this kind of like jealousy of like, look how united they are. Um, look how look how they have a sense of identity that we're lacking. The, this is this is the odd kind of rhetoric that you see time and time again when he refers to the Hungarians, and not just him, but everyone, um, talking about the Hungarians, the Germans, the Albanians. Like um, I think Vuk was talking about the Albanians, saying, "Look at them; they have all these different religions, but they're all Albanian first. Hmm. How'd they pull it off? And the the Slavs haven't, you know. And so this is always like a, an issue, just kind of." sitting there um but yeah absolutely so starjevic uh he he really did conceive of everyone uh in the region with the exception of the bulgarians and all the minorities that we just mentioned um as as croats and he thought of their political emancipation in a croatian state as an act of progress that this is casting off um, the old regimes that had enslaved the peoples. And I think you see this time and time again with any kind of like rhetoric of national liberation. Mm. Yeah, I think it's inherent in the concept of it. And, you know, this, it becomes like this wonderful uh, freedom fighting anti imperial rhetoric, but at its core, it, it's deeply nationalist. Yeah, always. Yeah. And I mean, so, I mean, this kind of okay. The, the episode that we're doing now and the one that we did about Serbian nationalist projects. I mean, my hope is that they will show how much of um, how much the whole national idea is inherently violent in a way and artificial. Well, I mean, today is kind of mm-hmm. we live in a world created by nationalist ideology, so it's taken for granted now uh, that that yeah. people have nation, like na- nationhood, the national identity. But this is something that was that needed to be enforced. And I mean, and this. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and this is another thing, like in, in talking about these philological debates, um, this is largely like these ideas of where the nation starts and stops. These were largely debates between a bunch of nerds mm. at the time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Who, a bunch of pretty, pretty elite nerds too. Right. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the gentleman's agreement in Vienna, like these are these are philologists, these are linguists, these are people deeply involved in publishing and printing, um, often in the upper echelons of politics. 
um, if not at least very well connected. And they're, they're just squabbling amongst themselves about issues that are entirely academic, that academia would later go on to show were stupid to begin with. But uh, <laughs> this, is, this is basically the idea. I mean, they're, they're arguing about something that, you know, could be sorted out years later saying, oh, okay, I get it. It's all artificial. Um, but they saw political stakes in it. Yeah. And I mean, there were nerds who wanted to attach themselves to powerful killers, also known as like statesmen. So this is yeah. <laughs> this is how you get, I mean, nations, I guess. In you know. <laughs> it sums it up pretty yeah. well. That's how you got James Mason. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Starchevich, um, we can we can kind of wrap up with him in that he's basically the counter boot where Vuk said, oh, all these people who um, are actually Serbs but claim to be otherwise, they're just wrong. Starcevich said, hey, you're right, it's that they're all actually Croats. Um, but, yeah, you get But idea. Bosnians are the best. This is where they agree. They all agree Bosnians are the best. <laughs> I see a problem here, though. If he was the Antichrist and also the counter Vuk, mm. that kind of implies uh -huh. that Vuk is Christ. In, in heavenly Serbia, yeah. yes. Well, man, yeah, I guess they were right. Thank you, Stachy. Now, what's really funny is if you look at some of the Franciscan literature in, in Bosnia in, like, the 1860s, around the time that a lot of this was taking place, um, you have the Bosnians themselves saying, oh, my God, uh, our neighbors, let's... To be clear, call them evil and yovo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one being a kind of stereotypically Catholic, one being a more orthodox name, right? Yeah, they mean Serbs and Croats. Yes, at this yes, point. yes. Um, they say our neighbors love us so much, and they're saying, "Hey, Bosniak, you must use our name to talk about yourself." And the others say, "No, you sh you need to use our name." And out of love for us, they're going to tear us into two. And uh, the same writers who, by the way, are Catholic, and this is kind of important, they're Franciscans, um, they're saying, why can't we just be Bosniak like we've always been? And they say very explicitly, um, what's his name? Uh, Knezhevich, I think is uh, this particular Franciscan. He, he writes something along the lines of like, oh, it's it's really nice that our neighbors have taken our language to use as their national language. Like, we're deeply flattered by this, um, but we're not cool with them forcing us to call it by their name. Cute. 19th century trolling. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> I mean, Franciscan trolling. so why didn't the Bosnian national idea form in the 19th century? They didn't have good enough nerds or what? <laughs> <laughs> um they they had plenty they had plenty except they they were writing in uh the arabic script mm. primarily um no it, well, like it, in or whatever. <laughs> right right exactly mm. uh no the the problem was actually that you had two competing ideas of how to be a non-sectarian, inclusive South Slav movement mm -hmm. competing in the same space, one of them in Cyrillic and being spread through Serbian Orthodox schools and the other being in Latin script and spreading through primarily Catholic schools. And so you had these two ideas with different names spreading in the same area at the same time. And the result of this was largely that ethnicity was revealed, especially in Bosnia at the time, for what it largely is. It's a political stance. And you had people from the same family saying, OK, I'll, I'll be a Serb and, you know, you're a Croat. Mm -hmm. And the reasoning for this was largely that, you know, these were people who believed in, you know, a, a broad, unified nation. and. A, a South Slavic nation, etc. However, they had different ideas on how this nation would look, um, this country should look. One of one would be that 
it would be united under Belgrade as, you know, the new Piedmont. Um, another would be that it would be a unification of the land, of the South Slavic lands within Austria-Hungary. And there was even the trialist notion which said that Austria-Hungary should actually be split into three and it should be Austria-Hungary-Croatia. And you would basically cut off huge parts of Hungary to create a third, you know, a, a third portion of Austria-Hungary to make Austria-Hungary-Croatia. And you had certain minor figures supporting this, like Franz Ferdinand. <laughs> and, um, you know, people who were like deeply anti-Hungarian and very pro-Croat, um, who would say, you know, it's kind of odd in retrospect to, to think of Franz Ferdinand as a South Slav nationalist, but in a lot of ways he was, um, because it was a way to reward the grateful nation while punishing the Hungarians, and he despised Hungarians. <laughs> and so this was an elegant solution, was to balance it by creating a South Slav state. Yeah, some, uh, uh, and this idea was, I think, revived briefly after the First World War, immediately after it, as a, an attempt to save Austro-Hungary, uh, so it's it, the idea was to restructure it as an um, empire with three parts. So the third one would be a Slavic part. But okay, did it, yeah. Uh, but it's also it's interesting because this is an older idea. I I, all, um, I wanted to mention earlier when you we were talking about the Illyrian movement because there was this like Serbian weirdo uh, in the 17th century called Count uh, George Brankovic, um, who who was like a Serb from Transylvania, and he I mean he. Claimed that he is the descendant of the like the Serbian medieval dynasty Brankovic. He was not related to them. Brankovic, yeah, Brankovic. Yeah, the ones with the chain of bakeries and niche. <laughs> no, the ones that. Um, there you go, listeners. Yeah, travel advice. The in the mythology, Vuk Brankovic was the traitor at the Battle of Kosovo right. in 1388. But I mean, in the reality, this was not the case. But them, yeah. Because they were like the last ruling dynasty, uh, supposedly, of the medieval state. And he claimed that he's uh, their descendant. It's kind of a um, crazy guy uh, in the 17th century, but uh, I, I would say a, kind of a proto-nationalist in some way. And he managed mm-hmm. to get, a, he made, uh, managed to become a noble, a noble uh, Austrian nobleman. He got um, the title of like an imperial count or something like this. Mostly because he was promising that he will be able to uh, like round up, mobilize Serbs and Slavs in the Balkans against the Turks for Austria. And he had this idea of basically the same idea of Austro-Hungary becoming uh, this uh, empire with ter- three poles, let's say. And the third one should be the Slavic pole. And he was using the term Illyrian. Uh, and he wanted mm. to be, become, uh, become the prince of Illyrians. Like, um, he failed. I think they, he ended up in an Austrian prison. They like, arrested him. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's also it's interesting because for me, um, because we can see how, um, like in this early modern stage, even before like Serbian or Croatian nationalist projects were formed, there were already some kind of, proto-Yugoslav nationalist projects being formed, like in, in process of being formed, which is kind of interesting that, you know, the because usually from a Serbian or Croat nationalist perspective, uh, the, this Yugoslav nationalist is something that came as a kind of afterthought, artificial, but you see it, you know, even being like discussed in, among some intellectuals, even before like the Serb or Croat um, national ideas were formed. So, it, I mean, are there different circumstances like different nations could be like could have been formed mm-hmm. in these areas. Yeah, there, there was the same case in Croatia with an yeah. earlier figure. Was it Pavel Ritter Vitezovic? Uh-huh, uh-huh. yeah. Which I think would translate as like Paul Knight Knightly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Knight Knightly. I like the knightness there. But um, yeah, I mean, and, and this is funny. Like you, it it's really difficult to take these 19th century debates and transpose mm. them onto d- today's situation where yeah. these identities seem so fixed, where at the time people could actually be talked out of their nationality 
you know, yeah. they could read an article and be convinced and be like, oh, okay, um, I'm going to switch and now I'm served. You or, know, or like, like I'm that. totally willing to be talked out of mine, but nobody will do it. <laughs> yeah, or like uh, I know one topic that you wanted to discuss, but we don't have like the time to go into deal, detail with is like the Serbian okay. Catholic movement of the Dubrovnik. Like, oh, I mean, it was like a, 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 like a Serbian nationalist movement led by a Catholic priest in Dubrovnik who just decided that for some reason they wanted to be Serbs and unite with Serbia. Um, and it, it's even, it's funny when people also try and reclaim the past yeah. in this very anachronistic way. Yeah. So they're taking these Renaissance figures from Dubrovnik mm. and claiming them yeah. as one particular nationality. Yeah, ridiculous, yeah. So there was this classic case where a statue was unveiled yeah. in Dubrovnik of uh, Ivan Gundelic. Mm. And Ivan Gundelic, you know, was this Renaissance writer who wrote Osman and some other classic literary works um, from this period. And a statue was unveiled and it was paid for by figures from Zagreb as well as from Belgrade. And during the unveiling, both Serbian nationalists and Croatian nationalists <laughs> showed up because they thought it was their event. Yeah. <laughs> and it reminds me of like this Leibach concert I went to where like there are a bunch of anti-fascists and fascists who showed up at the same concert thinking, oh, yeah. it's our band. Yeah. Um, But what is uh, weird, I think, from today's perspective, I think that the Serbs kind of organized the whole thing and the making of the monument. And I think... Well, what's weirder is that he was an Italian who went by Giovanni Gondo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the mayor uh, of Dubrovnik at the time had the last name Gondola, but he was somehow attached to this, like, Serb Catholic thing. Because, like, it was like, right. I mean... I mean, why not? I mean, you can be whatever you want. I mean, this is the nationalist thing, <laughs> but, you know. And it's it's the same with um, the astronomer yeah. who discovered that the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, um, yeah. Rudolf Boschkovich. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, he's claimed as, like, this incredible Croatian astronomer. At the same time, he's claimed as, well, he's a Catholic Serb uh, from Dubrovnik, Um And even though he identified as Croatian, you know, his family was actually Serbian. Yeah. And then the Italians are like, well, he kind of kept saying he was Italian. <laughs> um, like, do we go by his word? Uh, but, you know, all of this was really fluid. He, he probably identified in many different ways, like most people did, or probably none. I mean, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you didn't have nations back then so i mean you can be a lot of things at the same time like by based on different criteria like like yeah, you said like you, you use different dialects different languages you can be uh, like a, a a dubrovnik person a croat a serb a italian at the same time in some way yeah and you you had different names too yeah. depending on which language you wrote yeah. like right. giovanni gondola wrote in italian ivan gondolic wrote in uh yeah the other language yeah. Um, but yeah i mean the this is the thing everything was was fluid these were largely political ideas that contained an idea about the people that they wanted to liberate yeah and whether or not the people who they wanted to liberate believed in it or not and this was the tricky part like first you need to convince someone that they need to be liberated Mm. this is also strikingly similar to like james mason again in a in a really surprising way this uh revolution without the consent of those who are revolting you know mm-hmm. wake up the nation you know when things oh, get yeah. bad enough they'll see they need us this kind of thing yeah <laughs> although i mean i think that's generally true even in you know kind of anti-colonial movements in general but right? yeah i mean mm-hmm. there are always a lot of people who identify with with the colonial ruler and and they always employed this rhetoric of waking up as well to mm-hmm, right. kind of make it ancient and project it into the past like oh it's time to wake up this you know the sleeping national giant. body that we just invented and they're still arguing about right yeah <laughs> wake up <laughs> don't don't wake up the baby everybody knows that what are you doing yeah i remember reading but this do wake stuff. up the bear huh? <laughs> <laughs> Some of the Bosnian Franciscan literature in the 19th century is like, how come only Bosnia sweetly sleeps? 
<laughs> Everyone else is awake. Uh, God, they were all dorks back then, weren't they? Yeah, pretty much. Hey there, listener. Just stepping in for a minute to give you a little break from all the historical and linguistic detail here. Why don't you give this a little pause, make a snack, pour a drink, go outside for just long enough to refresh yourself, but not so long that you forget that you're in this fucking thing with us and we're literally here waiting on you to get back so we can get to the Croatian national movement and the Frankovci and a couple other important deets in this tale. I mean, do your thing, but you know, we'll just wait here, I guess. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed whatever you did there. Uh, quick recap, nations are completely fictional and politically instrumental ideas. Duh. Everybody's ethnonym kind of means slave if you turn it a little bit that way and kind of hold it up to the light like this. Uh, Hungarian is weird and hard. Everybody's trying to claim Bosnia. Yeah, we also talked about Ante Starcevic's aggressive campaign to define the, the true Croat, despite his anti-clerical inclinations, and now Kamal's going to take us home by checking in with the Illyrian movement. Yep. You, so you said uh, you wanted to say something about how Croatian replaced Illyrian? Um, oh, um, yeah, that, that kind of happened. Um, and then we mentioned also, like, the whole Starcevic to Frank. Right, right. So, um, yeah, the, the Illyrian movement, actually by the mid-19th century, um, largely got scaled back. In, in their ambitions. Um, they no longer dreamed of connecting all the way to, to Istanbul, right? The, it increasingly became more practical and more and more focused on uniting lands within Austria-Hungary. And the lines between, the political lines um, that were drawn in the, the South Slavic portion of Austria-Hungary had been to the disadvantage of the the Illyrian movement and later Croatian nationalists because you had portions of it belonging to Hungary, you had portions of it belonging to Austria, um, you had free cities, you had the military frontier, which was under martial law for centuries, and then eventually, starting in 1878, you have the inclusion of Bosnia and Herzegovina which is neither Hungary nor Austria. Um, instead, it's ruled directly by the Joint Minister for Finance in Vienna. <laughs> so, the Minister of Finance? Wow. Minister of Finance. Interesting. So, Do you know why and, that is uh, specifically? I mean, it seems yeah, like... Yeah, the... um, he's, he's basically like the equivalent of the Grand Vizier, <laughs> where okay. the emperor you know, has the hereditary power, but the day-to-day running of the empire is handled first and foremost by the Minister of Finance, the Joint Minister of Finance, Hmm. who handles both the Imperial and the Royal. Um, So, Ka und Ka, uh, Kaiserlich und Königlich, um, this is the abbreviation for Imperial and Royal. And so, Bosnia was directly under Ka und Ka, uh, under the Minister of Finance. Hmm. So, they weren't connected through some kind of, you know, ancient nobility that had sworn allegiance to this king or that king is really the closest you have to a colonial project. Right, Austria. right. It's under like direct occupation by... Yeah. yeah. And it, it was perceived as a colony for the most part, of like a, a model colony. They wanted to show, you know, that they could bring Bosnia up in, in Europe and have it be a modern country and with like the kind of infrastructure that they were building. But so you had these divisions within Austria-Hungary that cut every which way in the South Slavic. And this was, you know, one of the main concerns of of the Illyrian movement and then finally the Croatian movement. And the Croatian movement as a nationalist movement was first and foremost concerned with unifying Croatia within Austria-Hungary. Now, for historical reasons, what's you know, today's Croatia had been split into several kingdoms at the time. Um, You had the Kingdom of Croatia, which was centered in Zagreb. Um, You also had the Kingdom of Slavonia, um, which had formerly been Ottoman territory. That's not Slovenia or Slovakia. This is Slavonia, which is a part of Croatia. For all listeners, it is a part of (laughs) modern-day Croatia. (laughs) And and then Hungary uh, at the time. It was... uh, a kingdom 
a separate kingdom that was carved out of the recently conquered Ottoman lands. Mm -hmm. um, so you have Kingdom of Slavonia and the Kingdom of Croatia, and they both have their own parliaments. At some point, they're merged, and it becomes the Kingdom of Croatia, Slavonia, and it becomes hyphenated, and it's based in Zagreb. And at the same time, you have the Kingdom of Dalmatia, which is largely the lands that had been Venetian that only passed into Austro-Hungarian rule after Venice fell to Napoleon. And so these lands have their own parliament as well. Um, and they, I, I believe it's based in Zadar, and their parliament is Italian speak. And so, so these are all, these are all of, provinces of Austro-Hungary and the king of this kingdom is the Austrian emperor. But for some like historical reasons, they have these names of kingdoms, I guess. Um, so they're technically kingdoms, yeah. and they all happen to have the same king, <laughs> who's <laughs> also the emperor. Yeah. <laughs> and depending on like the legal basis for it, um, the king of Croatia and the king of Slavonia is the king of Hungary, who's also the Austro-Hungarian emperor, mm -hmm. <laughs> while the king of the kingdom of Dalmatia is directly the, the emperor of Austria. Mm -hmm. um, this is what so, I love about monarchism. It's so simple. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I see it, why people want to bring it back. What's it's so clear. About that? It's so clear. And so around this time in, in the mid-19th century, you see this major political demand coming from, from Zalkrit saying, we want to unify at least the lands that we have already within this empire. Um, and so the, 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 the first way that they did this was just doing it symbolically, where they declared themselves the Triune Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And in all of their national imagery from this period, you see the crest of Dalmatia and Slavonia and Croatia all together. And... They call themselves the Triune Kingdom of Croatia, Slavonia, Dalmatia. However, Dalmatia was never a part of it, officially. And what? Yeah, Dalmatia was not a part of this kingdom. So you was have that their the mascot? King, well, Dalmatia was a separate kingdom that Croatia, Slavonia wanted to include. And so they changed their name to include it, but <laughs> didn't actually include it. <laughs> So you have to, it's a bold the, move because the emperor was not for this, kingdom, yeah. which was never more than two kingdoms. But yeah. okay, both kingdoms of the triune kingdom, exactly. <laughs> and once Bosnia came into the picture, it was even more complicated. And so these ideas of like having <laughs> this idea of having Austria Hungary Croatia, the Croatia part was actually supposed to be four different kingdoms, and it was the the kingdom of Croatia, Slavonia, Dalmatia, and Bosnia that were united as the crown lands of King Zvonimir. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this was the idea. And so, like, there was a lot of, you know, bureaucracy, <laughs> a, a lot of uh, paperwork involved in being an attorney in Austria-Hungary, I imagine. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a very difficult time. And so this largely became their focus of uniting these lands. And so once the Illyrian movement got banned, um, they reformulated it as the Croatian national. Movement. Okay. And the, it was a scaled down version where they said, okay, let's at least unite the lands within Austria and Hungary. And so this became the prime, the primary goal of the Croatian nationalist movement. Um, there was also let's rename the uh, the time we're talking about. Just yeah, yeah. Let's remind listeners exactly what what time are we talking about yeah. right now? Just to touch base. Second half of the nineteenth century at this point. And so, is Starčević the ideologue of this movement, or what his relation to this movement? Uh, Starčević wanted full independence. Mm -hmm. He he did not want any subservience to to Vienna. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted to do it legally, and he wanted. The relations to be on the basis of like legal international treaties, which he felt were the only way to conduct relations between. 
sector. So what was his relation to this national movement that wanted united Croat lands inside Austro-Hungary? Um, so that's kind of tenuous. Mm-hmm. Like um, a lot of a lot of the push for having uh, a, a reformed Austria-Hungary mm-hmm. only came later mm-hmm. um, when the Hungarians were actually more amenable to it. And this largely has to do with uh, certain trends with the Croatian uh, Hungarian relationship throughout the 19th century and certain agreements that they came to regarding the separate legal status of Croatia. Um, and specifically the idea that the Hungarian parliament would have any say over what happens in Croatia is very contentious. Mm. Um, and however, um, there was an incident in, uh, I think it was like 18, 1895, I want to say, something around then, where the the Austrian emperor came and visited Zagreb and a bunch of Croatian national students burned a Hungarian flag in front of the emperor. And this caused a big scandal and it caused a major rift within the the Croatian party of right that actually this was Starcevich's party. And so wait, these were activists in his party that did this then? Yes. Oh. Yeah. The, these were student activists, right? And, and they burned this flag and it ended up causing like an international incident and a split within the party where you had two factions formed. Those who said, this is a bit too much for us. Like we don't condone this. And the other saying, this looks great, fine. And so this split happened like uh, about a year before Starcevich's death. And the, the faction that formed around Starcevich um, was called the Pure Party of Right. And the other party of right went on and, and split completely at that point and became part of what was called the Croatian Serb Coalition, who actually stayed in power um, pretty much until the end of World War I. Um, but the, the Pure Party of Right was, uh, it basically happened while Starcevich was on his deathbed. He didn't get to see very much of it. This was, and, this was what I was about to ask. Was he, was he around for the split? Yeah, this was like at the very end of his life. And he basically had no say in the direction that the new party took. Mm-hmm. Um, and instead, uh, a young opportunistic politician, Josip Frank, uh, took over the pure party of right and claimed Starcevich's legacy um, as like the most popular figure in Croatia, Croatian politics at the time. Uh, Starcevich was an, obviously an old man at this point, 1890s, who'd been around. And he had been living in uh, the Starcevich house in Zagreb, which was given to him by the Croatian people. It's now the, the city library right on the main square. And um, so you have like this, uh, this old man on his deathbed and a young, ambitious politician, Josip Frank, who basically takes over the reins of the new party. It, it involves some, some further splits right afterwards where you have like the, the pure party of right and the pure party of right Ante Starcevich. And this kind of split continues until the present day where these kind of supporters of the party of right, they're called Pravashi from the word right. Um, I think there's like six or seven different Pravashi parties out there. Um, taking, I think a few of them take the name Anti Starcevich in the name of the party. <laughs> so I know in Bosnia, there's one, it's like party of right, 1990 Anti Starcevich. Or something. So it's a, it's like looking like, at a, yeah. at an index of the different communist parties in like India, for example, where it's like CPIM ML CPIM ML 1961 CPIM ML <laughs> like you know, and these uh, exactly different party of rights uh, today they like encompass um, like a wide range of different ideologies from the far right to neo-Nazi today, I guess. Yeah, yeah. 
very, very far range. Like <laughs> <laughs> from the far right to the extremist right to the neo Nazis, it's yeah. it's amazing. From fascist to Nazi. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, There's room for everyone. Um and so yeah, that's that's kind of the, the fate. Um the the thing is with with Josef Frank and under Frank's leadership. Um Josef Frank had a very interesting relationship with the Catholic Church, where he he wasn't born Catholic. Uh, he was born to a Jewish family and later converted. Hmm. But he seems to have used the Catholic Church in the most opportunistic ways possible. And now that the the conception of the Croatian nation had been scaled down to the territories of Austria-Hungary, um, he thought it would actually be kind of ridiculous not use the force of the Catholic Church to unify those lands. And so he embraced the Catholic Church in his conception of what it meant to be a Croat. And mm -hmm. part of this meant translating the Slavo-Serbian group, the Slavo-Serbi, who had before been, you know, a political trend within Habsburg politics, had suddenly become an ethnic group uh, when uh, Frank was speaking about them. And this definitely became the case in, uh, in the aftermath of World War I, when these lands did become part of Yugoslavia under the rule of Belgrade. And I I'm sure you'll talk about more, you'll talk more about that when you address the, the Ustache, which is basically the, the militant faction of the pure body of right. In yeah, I mean, so Franco, Frank's pure party of rights, they were also called Francozzi, and they were mm -hmm. the kind of the main party of rights in, they survived uh, until Yugoslavia was formed, and they were like an active party in Yugoslavia in the 20s and 30s, this Francozzi faction. So they had a, like a deputy or, or a few, because they were not, um, they existed, but they were not the main, far from being the kind of main or the most popular Croatian party, even the they were not even the most popular nationalist Croatian party in uh, the monarchist Yugoslavia. That was the uh, the the peasant party uh, led by Stepan Radic. Okay. So, uh, so it was kind of a smaller party, uh, but they had deputies in the parliament. And one of the deputies from the Frankovci or the Pure Party of Rights in Belgrade was Ante Pavelic, for example. Right. Yeah. yeah. Who would later, of course. Go on to become the yeah. Ustasha Fuhrer. I mean, he left Yugoslavia when uh, King Alexander Karadžić proclaimed his dictatorship in 1929. He went abroad, and basically, this is the the, the origin story of Ustasha's. Right, right. Yeah. The 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 split between the party of right. Uh, I think the the other faction was led by uh, Frano Supila. I believe his name was. And he was the one who led the party into what was called the Croatian-Serbian coalition mm -hmm. and believed in cooperation with the, the Serbian faction of, in Croatian politics. And um, it was the pure party of right under Franck that relied on the Catholic Church um, in, in order to oppose uh, this, this partnership push Croatian nationalism in a very different direction. And at the time, both sides claimed the legacy of Ante Starčević. Yeah, right. So there was no, um, was there any uh, like faction in the Croatian nationalist movement that was, that was like insurrectionist in the 19th century that wanted to like... Uh, yeah, yeah, so um, there was, mm -hmm. and um, this was something that Starčević was actually involved mm -hmm. in. Um, and it was an armed insurrection. Right, this was in the uh, late 19th century? Yeah. Uh, this was earlier on. This was, it was um, a, a revolt mid, against who? Uh, who? Uh, Austria-Hungary. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so he, he was involved in, you know, this kind of radical faction, but um, I don't believe he actually in, uh, supported any kind of armed struggle. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's... Uh, he he was first and foremost a lawyer who felt that the party actually who who felt that the Croatian people already had the right to self determination. 
Okay. That, you know, it was written into the laws. The, um, the secret laws that he discovered. Right, right. So. The natural order. I mean, there was something that I was thinking maybe would be a good theme for um premium episode or a part of a premium episode, which is the, I don't know how, how much you know came out about the, the there was this crazy idea in the early 20s there were negotiations between the Frankovci and um, the Serbian, like the People's Radical Party. Uh, do you know? Yeah, I, I don't know much about that one. Though. I mean, it's very uh, interesting. They're like it's completely unknown. I mean, I think it's completely unknown by the maybe his, some historians know about it, but they don't talk much about it. It's like there is a. Uh, I mean, they were like in negotiations with the like the People's Radical Party and. Uh, the guy who was representing the party was Ante Pavelic. So he was, Ante Pavelic was the contact for Fra- Frankovci with the Serbs, which is totally, mm-hmm. and so he was guy, he was their Pashic guy. And, yeah. and it, there was this idea of uh, transforming the Frankovci into the Croatian radical party. Um, and like uh, having a federal uh, radical party for Yugoslavia, which would have like, a Serbian and Croatian, I guess, some Slovenian part in it. So they were even like ready to make some concessions, like to being a part of Yugoslavia and to become radicals. And and one of them, like, which is like this, wasn't a, uh, one of these Frankovci guys with some intellectual called um, something like Shafli, Shafli, Shafli. Ah, Milan Shufla. Yeah. yeah. Shufla. He Doesn't wrote. Bother me. Yeah, Shufla is an interesting guy. He wrote a manifesto uh, of the. Croatian People's Radical Party, like uh, which he wanted to start with, I don't know, Ante Pavelic or someone. I mean, Shufla is, I think the most interesting thing about him is mm. he almost went out of his way to become the number one enemy of Belgrade mm. in that he was a Croatian nationalist, but also a scholar as the world's leading albanologist. Yeah. And was a specialist in Albania and had written like the Codex Albanicus or whatever. And so, yeah, he's he still like, celebrated as a as a major hero in in Albania. In oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he really. But I mean, there was and, a period when he wanted to be a component of like the radical party led by Pashi, which is like so. This is, but what happened to him is uh, he kind of fell awry with the authorities because of his pro-Croatian and pro-Albanian attitudes. Mm. And there were two Serb policemen who were dispatched from Belgrade who murdered him in front of his house in Zagreb with a hammer yeah. and stole the the codex of his they stole his manuscript for Albanology. <laughs> so there's the unpublished part that was stolen by these um, hammer murder and ex murder would later be the style of Udba. That'll do, Ray. That'll do. Well, listener, I'm proud of you. You're equipped now to uh, continue with us down this treacherous path of Balkan national history, or rather, the history of national in the Balkans, or rather, the Balkanization of history and nationalism, something like that. Anyway, this is a free app. You know, we've got premium apps on our Patreon. Check it out. Patreon.com slash Tenipod. And, uh... Subscribe, share, check out our Twitter, Tenapod also. All right. See you in the next episode.